Welcome to Stuff They Didn't Teach Me in Sunday School. A couple of weeks ago, we made the point that the word witness and martyr were basically the same word in Greek. Witness and martyr are going to be the same concept in Acts chapter 6. Acts 6 begins with a, a little bit of a conundrum or a problem that the disciples are having. Uh, apparently, uh, there is a food distribution going on among the Christians, and within, within Jewish culture in Jerusalem, there were really two different kinds of Jews. There were the Jews that held fast to the old traditions, to the Jewish culture. There were other Jews that had become more Hellenized, had adopted some Greek aspects of the culture. And it appears that um, whoever was doing the food distribution was, was not taking adequate care of the Hellenized Jews, of the Jews that adopted Greek culture. The disciples feel like this is something that they don't need to mess with. They need to appoint people to mess with it. So they find seven men. They appoint them to do it. And we have a list of the seven men in Acts chapter 6, verse 5. What they said pleased the whole multitude. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. The only two that you hear much about after this are Stephen and, and Philip. And we want to focus in on Stephen. Stephen, full of grace and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. So Stephen, who was actually chosen to help serve the tables, is now also doing miracles, and he's about to also give a pretty bold public testimony. Um, seems like he's mixed in some other things with, with serving tables here. But we're told in verse 9, Then some of those who belong to the synagogue of the freedmen, these are former slaves probably, and of the Cyrenians and of the Alexandrians and of those from Cilicia and Asia arose and disputed with Stephen. So Stephen, Stephen is proclaiming the gospel. Some of the Jews are taking exception to what he says. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he spoke. And they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. Where have you heard that before? Those are the same charges, the same things that happened with Jesus. I want you to look at all the parallels between Stephen and Jesus. They instigated people to bear false witness, number one. And number two, they charged him with blasphemy. And verse 12, they stirred up the people. That's, verse, that's the third parallel. And the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses, same as Jesus, who said, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place, the temple, same as Jesus, and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place. Same charge they brought against Jesus. So this is like deja vu all over again, as our local St. Louis baseball announcer says uh, sometimes. Deja vu all over again. It's the same thing. He will change the customs which Moses delivered to us. The high priest says in chapter 7, verse 1, is this so? And then Stephen, rather than saying yes or no, launches into his first, as far as we know, and last sermon. His sermon will take these people through the history of Israel, through their own history. He will take them through how they have rebelled against God throughout the decades, the centuries, since God first called them out of Egypt. In verse 51, here's his summary. It's not particularly winsome. He never gets to the gospel message. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of your prophets did not your fathers persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You received the laws delivered by angels and did not keep it. That was his undoing. He doesn't get to tell them about a Savior who loves them. He doesn't get to that point because they cry out and charge him and grab stones and kill him with stones. And they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and rushed together upon him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. A young man named Saul. Luke does that quite often. He will introduce a character 
just kind of casually before that character becomes a main character. And so here you're introduced to sort of the coat check man at, at Stephen Stoning. And as they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Another piece out of Christ's crucifixion. And he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Ah, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And we're told that Saul was consenting on his death. That stoning of Stephen, we're told in the beginning of chapter 8, caused a great persecution to come up against the church. And the Christians began to scatter. They got out of Jerusalem. The, the, the persecution was focused in Jerusalem. The apostles stayed, but the rest of the people left. And we're told as they, as, as they left, as these Christians fled from Jerusalem, they took that gospel message with them. So even though we're going to focus on the spread of the gospel message by the apostles, there's a spread of this gospel message going on by, by lay people, by farmers, by, by store clerks, by um, tailors, by every, every line of work. People that are Christian are taking that message out to where they, they go. God has a way of working good out of evil. The stoning of Stephen is evil. But the result of it is this intense persecution of the church in Jerusalem that gets this church to, to move out and to spread the gospel beyond the city walls of Jerusalem. God knows what he's doing.